this is episode 11 of the Luster Leadership Series. This series explores AEC industry trends, highlighting the voices of the industry. Today, I have the honor to speak with Glenn Jardin. Let me start off by giving you a brief picture of who Glenn is, because we have a phenomenal interviewee here with us today, if I may say so. So, Glenn M. Jardine, PE, retired from CBRE in February 2023 as the leader of CBRE's program project management business in North and South America. The business encompassed over 1,300 employees with annual revenues of $300 million. Glenn was named Executive Managing Director for CBRE immediately upon the purchase of HERI by CBRE in October 2017. He has 46 years of experience, the last 41 of which have been with CBRE HERI. Mr. Jardine is a registered mechanical engineer in 13 states, is a lead accredited professional, and is a 1977 graduate of the Georgia Institute of Technology. He was actively involved as principal in charge for several complex design and management projects for the firm, such as the Mayo Clinic, Delta Airlines, the Home Depot's corporate headquarters, and most recently for the Oak Ridge National Laboratory and Hartsfield-Jackson Atlanta Inter International Airport's $6 billion expansion program. Glenn has authored numerous articles and spoken on energy con conservative design, sustainability, construction procurement uh, methodologies, master planning, and project management. In his previous position as the executive managing director, he was responsible for the strategic direction and growth of the firm, as well as the overall integration of HERI into CBRE global business. I would also like to mention that Glenn is a regular guest speaker for a graduate level business practices class in the School of Architecture at Georgia Tech, as well as being active in several community and service related activities. Glenn serves as a mentor to the School of Mechanical Engineering at Georgia Tech, and he currently serves on the board for the Campbell Education Foundation and is on the Economic Development Committee for the Metro Atlanta Chamber of Commerce. Glenn, it is so great to have you here with us today, and thank you again for agreeing to be interviewed for our series. Sure. Well, I think it's a real honor and a privilege. I think the world of Mr. Luster and the firm, so when you guys asked me to do this, I was very happy to do it, even though I've been retired for six months. I'm just happy to do it because, as you'll hear me say many times, this is a people business, and it's about relationships, so I'm really, really happy you guys reached out, and I'm happy to be able to impart a little bit of my life lessons. You know, as you said it, I've got 46 years of experience. The last 41 were really with, with Heary. And, you know, when I came to Heary, we were 200 people. I was so fortunate to be able to come on at a time when the firm was growing, when we had such great leaders and great mentors and people that just took me under their wings and helped me and coached me. And I've lived through helping that firm and that team grow to over 1,500 people, wow. to going through some ownership and acquisitions. Uh, and ownership changes, and uh, I've been able to learn from that and emerge. I mean, I must have been having a good time because 46 years later, I just blinked and it's all over here and I'm, I'm enjoying retirement. But I, I really appreciate you reaching out to me because over those 46 years, I have learned a few things. And I'm really happy to, to press that uh, or to help uh, publicize that and help other people. Uh, people ask me, like, what's the number one lesson that you've learned? So when I look back and I look at those 46 years, the last 41 with a company that's been through a lot of changes, but still it was the same company, the same culture. You know, companies change, ownership yes. changes, leadership changes, and your strategy changes sometimes many times in a year. So I learned early in my career through some really great coaching and mentoring that you got to accept the fact that things are going to change. So yeah. you have to accept it, you have to understand it, and you have to embrace it. And if you do that, you can probably make yourself more valuable to your firm and to your clients. And then ultimately that makes you more valuable. So again, uh, Raina, really happy to be here. I'm ready to answer some questions that you've got prepared. Yes. Well, first, I just want to acknowledge what you just said, because I think that this is so true for the industry, but I would also make it 
like a broader statement, it's true for life. Change is inevitable. And the more that you can be, I would say, sort of malleable to change, be that in the office, in the industry, even just in your personal life, yeah. I think you kind of, you're kind of given the secret to life there, Glenn. Like you, you have to be able to shift and move, move and sort of ebb and flow with change, which is going to come no yeah, matter what. You're right. It, it's the secret sauce. And we all know that yeah. engineers and architects are not the best people for change. <laughs> and I have dealt with that. I'm an engineer, mechanical engineer, but I've dealt with that all my life and all my career. Right. And yeah. when there's people like that, then you're just going to have to help them and coach them to understand and be able to accept what they can change and then how to make the most of it. So yes, it's true. Yeah. You have it's to true. Help I would say, I think like for, for me too, not that this is about me, but um, I think that I, I agree with you because I think with being an artist, you do kind of have to get used to change. Um, be it stand up, be it, you know, art, like painting or drawing, you know, you make a miss little step and then you have to, you have to turn that into the art. So I, I would agree with yeah. you. That's, that's very true. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to start off with a first question. We've got, you know, different things to cover because I cannot wait to continue to pick your brain, seeing that you have so many years in the industry. Um, and, you know, you've seen such tremendous change in the industry, in AEC industry in general. Um, what fundamental changes remain to make the industry competitive, would you say? Yeah. So I think when I hear competitive, I also hear the word relevant. So all my life and all my career, I've been struggling to make sure that my firm, my team is always relevant. We're always the best solution for that client. That's the same thing you guys are always trying to do. So when you think about the business in my 46 years, you know, certainly technology has changed, yes. but it's really the speed. Everything's happening so much faster. Uh, and I also, when I think about change in the industry that I've seen, a lot of that comes through the clients. Okay. So clients and their contracts have changed a great deal. Uh, so, you know, to be relevant and to be competitive, we've got to change how we deliver our services. So if you yeah. want to sit back and do the same thing day in and day out, you're not going to survive in this world. You're going to have to know and uh, understand, accept the fact that we're going to have to be adaptable and flexible. And I think, Maria Raina, one of the things I really want to think about change, you know, 30 years ago, clients were buying some services. They would buy a package of services, X number of man hours to do something. And we were comfortable selling and providing a package or a little piece. Well, nowadays clients, they want an outcome. They just don't give you a contract for X number of man hours or, or this piece of work. They want successful outcomes, which means again, we've got to change. We've got to be focused on how do I deliver a successful outcome? And then the contracts are a lot tougher than they used to be. So there's a lot more liability and a lot more responsibility. So as professionals, we've got to be aware of that and we've got to manage and control that. But Clients are different. And I think that's driven a lot of the change in our business. But I will tell you, over 46 years, the one constant is it is a people business. It's yeah. still all about relationships. It was when I came to Huey day one. And it was when I left uh, February, still about people, still about relationships. And it's a business that's really, it's collaborative. And it's yeah. based on those relationships. And what hasn't changed is you have to have clear communication. You got to be able to talk to your client about expectations, you've got to be able to coach and, and uh, communicate with your team. So, you know, none of that has changed over the past 46 years. But I will tell you, in the last 20 years of my career, I spent a lot of time and I'm really passionate about trying to find the right talent. You got to find them, you got to coach them up, and then you got to retain them. Yeah. So when you can uh, find people, help further their career goals, and if that matches the strategy of the firm, that's as good as it gets. You know, that is the secret sauce. So from the last 20 years, I learned a long time ago, it's really about people and it's all about getting people and energized and focused. So if you can, you know, find the right people with the right career paths, put them in a position to succeed, uh, that's as good as it gets. And when you get all that aligned, that's great for the client and it's great for the firm. So yeah, there's change out there and it's going to continue to change. But again, as long as we accept that and we understand we're going to have to change and probably take on more. That's, that's just the future. That's what we're going to have to do to be successful. That is so true. And it, it kind of, it, it makes me think about things that Lester stands for. Um, because for example, you know, really being able to pull people into this industry who already have an interest, 
but maybe don't know exactly, like they can't see themselves exactly, where where do I fit in? And so what you're talking about, what you do or what you did, what Lester continues to do is being able to kind of meet these new changes, meet this new technology and really try to pull in young people to be like, hey, you know what? I, I know you can't see exactly where you fit in here, but you're interested in the industry. Here's a place for you. Here's a relationship that we're now building with you. And so that that kind of goes into what yeah. you're talking about, which is so yeah. important specifically in this kind of industry. And you, you want people to be successful. So I, yes. I've told this story for 30 something years. People are tired of hearing it, it here, but it's about, I'm not. I haven't heard yeah. it yet. <laughs> so, so, you know, we're, a, we're a big baseball team and I, you know, I right. played, I coached, my son played and the most successful teams are when everybody understands their position and their yes. responsibility. And when the game's on the line, that first baseman is going to make a tremendous catch. He's going to dig one out of the dirt because that's yeah. all he's done. That's all we expect. We don't expect him to be the fastest guy on the team or be able to play six different positions. So when everybody knows where I fit in, they know the expectation, they know that this is what's asked of me and this is how I'll be successful and hence the team, man, that's great. Cause I, I just watched that over and over the years of my career, when you put teams together and everybody yeah. understands and accepts and, and they're accountable for their role, man, great things happen then. It's when you put yes. people out of their comfort zone and you know, they're not going to be successful and they know it. That's not going to work for anybody, but no, you get everybody not. slotted in the right position that's best for them. Man, that's what that's when the magic happens in our. It business. is, and like you said, it's when people can then shine, and when these individuals on a team can shine, the team wins. Now, I didn't play, I didn't play baseball. I did play softball for like one year, and I did have an amazing catch, and I played on first base, and we did win that game. I'm not trying to toot my own horn. I'm just trying to relate to what you're talking about. I do know how important that is. And in yep, most yep, of the yep. other games where I didn't excel, the other teammates were excelling. So again, you, if you get a little moment, take your moment, take your shine. But the most important thing is that the team wins. Yep. Yep. Yes. I love that. Okay. So I'm going to, I'm going to move on to my next question, which is, so the AEC industry is experiencing continued consolidation and you helped orchestrate the acquisition of your firm into a larger organization. Is this trend good for the industry? Would you say? But that, that's a really great question. And I'll tell you when it comes to consolidation in general, you know, when the strategies align and they fit and as long as the cultures also align, consolidation can be a great thing. So I will just say again, another quick story. So I came yeah. to Erie in 82, George Heary sold the business in 85, 86 to a British construction company, Balfour Beatty. They were great owners. They, they left the salon. They wanted to come over and learn more about America before they bought a big construction company. But it was a great acquisition and it was great for Heary because we grew like crazy. We had this great, you know, uh, financing and funding and this great big company behind us. And we just grew like crazy. And then Balfour Beatty bought a construction company. They bought Syntex in the early 2000s, which meant that our 1500 person company had to change because our construction management risk group really needed to go over to that new business that Balfour Beatty built. So we had a big change then. Balfour Beatty then bought Parsons Brinkerhoff in 2010, big professional services firm. And they said, well, why don't we get Heary, which is a professional services, architecture, engineering program, project management firm. Why don't we give them to Parsons Brinkerhoff? And we were we moved underneath Parsons Brinkerhoff. And I will tell you, it was not a cultural fit. And there was not an obvious strategy when that happened. It was just somebody saying, let's just make it simple and easy and roll these companies together. Mm -hmm. And that was a very, very, very hard time for our company because mm -hmm. the strategies didn't align. The people didn't align. The culture didn't align. It was just tough. So I will tell you, you know, I persevered through some tough times as many of my fellow Geary people did. But when we emerged from that, Balfour Beatty also realized they made a mistake buying that company because of the conflicts in their business. Now they were winning a small engineering project that would ace uh, Balfour Beatty out of a $2 billion rail program. So they decided that wasn't strategic. They sold Parsons Brinkhoff, but they pulled Geary out. So here we are, we're getting stood back up again, and then in 2015, I was in a meeting in London with the, the head of Balfour Beatty, and we were talking about all the conflicts because we had so many companies. Invariably, we all conflicted with one another. And there was always right. a strategy about how do we best serve the client? Where's the greatest margin to be made? So all of a sudden, you spend a lot of time looking inward 
instead mm. of taking care of your clients and doing what you should yeah. be doing. So we spent a lot of time just internally. It, and it's not a bad thing. It was not ever, you know, bare knuckles fighting. It was all about strategy. Who gets there first? How do we serve the client? But we were in London and the CEO, who I knew pretty well from the Olympics when he lived in Atlanta. So he just says, Glenn, what do you think about selling here? I think it's time to sell here because you guys have been a great acquisition for 30 years, but I think it's time to find a new home for here. And I said, that's a great idea. That's a great idea. Yeah. And we spent a year, uh, myself and another fellow, I was a COO at here at the time. We spent a year talking to firms all over the country about where does the Heary business and the Heary people best fit in. Right. And, you know, I learned a lot in that process, you know, and I also learned to recognize that's a great firm, but this would be a horrible fit, either for right. geographical reasons or management or strategy right. or culture. But, you know, when it came to CBR, we, when we met them and we started talking more about their fledgling project management business and what the acquisition of Heary would do to their project management and their design business. You know, we, we kind of, we had a roadmap. And the more yeah. we talked about geographically and the offices and, and our people, it was like, the light went off. It was for me, it was like, this is that case of one plus one equaling three because right. they needed us. They wanted us. They loved our project management design platform. We love their number of offices and their penetration in the market. And certainly a really, you know, it's the largest real estate company in the world. So the more we talked, it was great. And then we had a couple of meetings with their management team. And then the next thing you realize, man, the cultures are the same. They feel the same about right. their people and their clients that I do and the rest of the Heary team. So the more people we got together and started, you know, doing our dinners and going out for drinks and things like that. I mean, the closer we got to each other, we kept realizing that this is a great fit. This is yeah. not going to be hard. So CBRE acquired Heary in October of 2017. And up until I left, you know, five years later, when that acquisition started, we had 45 vice presidents. So I would mm -hmm. say 45 leaders of the firm. Five years later, only two have left two out of 45. So that tells wow. you it was a great fit. Our leadership was excited. And when leadership's excited, then their teams stay together. So we have had a phenomenal turnover rate. It's almost zero in five years because it made sense. The business worked. Everybody's career path now, they're seeing that, hey, wow, I can do a lot more now. I can offer a broader, broader range of services. I'm yeah. part of this hotshot brokerage team that's just winning work hand over fist. So because it was... I mean, it was strategic, it lined, it fit, but the culture's lined up. So that's what made it work. So, you know, when I talk, and I've lived through this now, so sometimes yeah. firms think getting bigger is better. I don't think bigger is better is a long-term sustainable action. Right. Uh, at the end of the day, a client still wants a subject matter expert to drive their project or their program. Yeah. And it really doesn't matter if that subject matter expert is working for a 10,000 person company or a local 200 person company. The client just cares about, I got to have the right leader, the right yeah. skill set, and the right team behind them. So a big, big firm, they got a lot of resources to draw upon, but there's nothing wrong with a small regional firm uh, serving that client. So I think it gives clients some big choices. But what I have seen, Rena, is as the market keeps changing, there's going to be a couple of giants. It's like yeah. what the banking business went through. There'll be a couple of That's big right. giant firms that do all things for all people. And then there's going to be a bunch of small specialist firms that are highly focused yeah. and they do great work. They're very, you know, they stick to their knitting. They're really, really good at what they do. And, you know, I think it's like comparing an aircraft carrier to a PT boat. You know, sometimes yeah. you need the aircraft carrier. Sometimes you need a super nimble PT boat. So I think clients are best served, but I do see, and I've seen this firsthand, those regional mid-sized firms, like a 400-person civil engineering firm yes. that kind of specializes in two or three states in a certain market, they're going to have a hard time living. I mean, and I've seen that now. So, you know, CBRE and here, we've been trying to buy firms and you, know, you could feel it from them. They want to be part of a larger national platform. They know they can't offer their staff career paths. So it's going to keep the market's going to keep taking care of itself. Some big, big giants and then some small, specialty PT boat kind of firms. But there's nothing wrong with that because I think at the end of the day, the clients, as long as the clients are well served. But, um, you know, is it good for the industry? I made myself a note. You know, it's yeah. just making it tougher 
on the mid-size firms. Right. I think the giants are going to continue to get bigger. Right. And as far as the employees, some people now are going to have to make choices. I mean, some people, yeah. what I always loved about Heary, and we never lost, even when we got bought by CBRA, we never lost that entrepreneurial spirit. Right. We've always, and I'll talk about this in another question or two, but yeah. we've always had that I'm accountable. Uh, I'm an entrepreneur. And through right. all these changes, again, 41 years of hearing for me, I never saw that change. You know, if you right. go to the leadership today, it still feels that way. It's still that entrepreneurial, really closely knit, closely knit culture. So you can have that within a big firm. CB is the world's yes. largest real estate company. It's 120,000 people. But we always felt like we had a place in the culture and uh, my people did well. That's what I cared about is my people. Yeah. Well, and, and and I mean, and that is that is what is important. The, the other thing that I pull from the story is I think in business, um, and I don't know if people think about it this way, but I'm, you know, making it relatable. You have to date before you, you build a partnership, which would be like a marriage. You have to date and you have to figure out whether something is a fit, which is like basically what you're talking about in this story. And so it's not, you know, people talk about like, failed relationships. Well, it's not, nothing is really a failure. You're, you're learning from all of these different experiences. You're learning from the things that fit, the things that don't fit. You know, you're learning about yourself, your firm, your employees. What are the needs that are being met? What are other things that we didn't think about that we need to now completely incorporate? And just like, you know, towards the end of your tale, really, it's like when you find that fit, and you say, oh, this feels good. We, we, we are like, our core values are in alignment. You know, um, the way that we do business is in alignment with the way you do business, the way that you take care of your employees. And then you're finding that marriage. And then you say, okay, we, we can do business together. And that is such an important process in business to, to not just jump in, but to date, Yeah, you know? Yeah. And you know, some of the people, some of the suitors that wanted to buy Harry, I would call them up the next day after we had an all day session and went through strategies. Yeah. I'd call them up and I'd just say, you know, I want to be honest with you. Just don't think it's a great fit. I just think right. the way you guys go to the market and the way we do things and the way our culture works, I just said, I don't think it's a great fit. So we yeah. shouldn't spend any, any more time, either one of us. And yeah. you'd be surprised how many times they say, hey, <laughs> that's very insightful. I would rather know that now instead yes. of wasting time or money or making the acquisition and have it fail yeah. horribly, which True. I bet half of them fail within two years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Glenn, you got such a great voice of how you kind of like break that down of it not being a good fit. I may have to hire you. This has nothing to do with this, but as I'm in the dating world, just to call the guys that it's not going to work out and you can just break up for me and be like, you know, it's just not a good fit for Raina. This is not going to work out. Hey, say, like, saying no is hard in our business. And I've had oh, to say is. no. I've had it's to hard. tell clients, no, I've had one of yeah. my best clients called and wanted us to do a TV studio years and years ago. Yeah. And I had to tell him, Fred, we're not your best choice. You right. know, I've, I've got the long list of TV studios on the attached blank sheet of paper. So right. we're not your best choice. I'll help you find a company. They're probably right. in California or New York. I'll find a company and I'll bring them to Atlanta and I'll help work with them. But, you know, I'm not your best choice. No. And then he later told me, he said, I appreciate your honesty. Yes. That's what relationships are based on, honestly. Yes, it's honesty. And it also, it allows the space for you to find your better fit and for them to find their better yeah. fit, which is, it's it's excellent. That's what it's yeah, really yeah, about. Yeah. Again, yeah, the team yeah, winning. Yeah. So so um, my next question, there's a growing trend of company leadership, spending more time performing tactical functions, putting fires out instead of str strategic planning. Um, and the result is a degradation in project quality and budget and scope creep. What is causing this imbalance of time, would you say? <laughs> That's a great question. And I tell you, we all struggle with that. I don't care if you're a large firm or a small firm. Right. But, you know, when we're talking about putting out fires, you know, what's interesting is if you look at our business, I'll bet you 95% of the management are people that came up through the ranks like me. Yeah. So they came up through the ranks, which means they're actually the best people to solve problems. Right. So fires naturally gravitate to, towards us. And most of us want to fix that because I don't want my teams or my clients struggling. I want to get involved and fix that. So I, I think, you know, when I thought more about your question, that's why it's so important to cultivate that next level of leadership and talent around you. You got to cultivate, you got to cultivate that. You got to have them ready. And I keep reflecting back. I think it's important to empower them. You know, yeah. they got to be accountable. 
but you got to give them the power and then you got to support them. And I would tell everybody that I have helped and coached that failure is not final, nor is it fatal. So right. you're going to make mistakes as long as you make a mistake, but you think it's for the betterment of the client or the project, I'll always have your back. Now, if you go make a mistake because you don't care or you were having a bad day, that's another discussion. But you know, if you made a mistake because you're trying your best, I'm going to have your back and everybody else will too. So it's really important to have that kind of a, of a team concept around you. So what I would tell my teams is we go back to the baseball story. If you help me, let me be the coach. Let me focus on the strategic issues. Right. And then I'm going to let you guys be the best that you can be and coach you up in your position. So instead of it becoming a fire, let's try to fix it when it's a smoldering ember. And that's in yeah. your, that's kind of your like level that. guys, you know, let's take, take care of it at your level before it has to become a fire and emerge. And if we all do that, we're going to find that right balance. Yeah. And then the other thing I was thinking about as I was thinking about your question and that I'm really happy and, and proud of is uh, th there needs to be a culture of empathy. You know, yes. we don't talk about empathy enough, but when you have people around you that see the world through somebody else's eyes, you know, and, and they see it and they feel it differently and you're empathetic to that. Right. You know, when I was it, all my years here, if somebody had a family member that passed away or they went through a divorce that is when everybody closes ranks. We take care of that person. We'll come in and work Saturday to help make up for them. But, you know, you get that kind of camaraderie and teamwork yeah. because you're empathetic and you're also empathetic to your clients. I can remember a few client stories where clients told me, Glenn, you guys got to come through for me. I got to have this factory open by May 1st or I'm going to lose my job. Right. Well, I said, I'm going to give you the very best effort and attention that I personally can. You got my word on it and I don't take that lightly. And then you get a bunch of people around you that all have that same kind of yeah. feeling and that empathy. Then that just makes for such a stronger, tighter team. You know, it's all about being collaborative and, and uh, collegial and building those bonds. So I think if you do that, if you have a good foundation, then you're not, I don't, I didn't spend much time on fires. I got to tell you the last five years yeah. of my career, it was mostly strategic, high level things, you know, growth and, but not, but it wasn't about putting out fires necessarily because I had great people around me at different places right. and different levels that made sure it didn't become a fire. Well, and it goes back to, again, as you've said, and we've said, it's, it's about the relationships and it's about humanizing your employees, yeah. your staff, your, your company. I mean, the company is comprised of humans um, who are coming from their walks of life and their life experiences. And that's not to be ignored. It's actually to be highlighted. And I would say that's that's something that definitely Lester, you know, we we have in common, Glenn, is, you know, Lester is all about the human, the person. We yeah. are one family, one team. And that's not just for Lester employees. That also goes for other companies that we collaborate with. You know, we just we just have extended, extended yep. family. That is how yep. we do business. Yep. Yeah. And there's some companies, there's some clients out there that want to treat us like commodities. Right. Let me tell you, as soon as I sniff that out, we're going to go the other way. Life is yeah. too short. I don't want to put yeah. my company or my people through anything like that. We, you know, we yeah. went to school. We've got many years of experience and we provide great solutions. We're not a commodity. We're not right. going to allow ourselves to be treated that way. No. So I, I've said no to a couple of large national clients just because I knew it wasn't going to be a great experience for our people or our right. business. Right. Smart. Makes sense. Yes. So this this question, I, I'm excited to ask you specifically because <laughs> of all of your incredible knowledge and experience within the industry. Um, and I just, I want you to think as I ask this question is, you know, we, we always have new hires. We always have people who end up watching, um, you know, these videos and gain something, I think the most from this specific question, which is, uh, <laughs> which is kind of on a completely different note, but it's still, it's still extremely relevant. So what advice would you give to young people looking to come into this industry? Well, great question. Actually, I did write down six things. I want to make sure I cover oh, I love all it. six. I don't okay, want to miss good. that. But no. yeah, so number one, my advice is learn, 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 learn. Okay. The day you graduate from college did not mean you were going to stop learning. And I will tell you the day I retired in February, I still learned a number, I still learned things on the last day I worked here. And right. when you bring that natural curiosity and yeah. just wanting to learn everything you can about the business or the clients, 
you know, if you bring that kind of mindset and attitude, chances are, you know, you're going to grow. People yeah. that are learning are growing. And when you're growing, you're helping your company and you're helping your success, success. You're helping yourself, sorry, be successful. Yes, so don't are. stop learning. Bring that natural curiosity to the office. Because I tell you what, I love it. When I see that in a young person, man, I love it. And I just want to nurture it and help them. Uh, number two, find multiple coaches and mentors. You're yeah. not going to find one person that's going to put their arm around your shoulder and, and take care of you and lead you on your career. And in, in my case, came to here in 82, George Sherry, the founder, was incredibly talented at business development, marketing, branding. And I, I always liked that. I mean, George would take me to play tennis with clients and prospects or go to dinner meetings. Then he started taking me to interviews, presentations, whatever you want to call them, meeting clients, talking about our firm and how we bring solutions. And but, So I learned business development for some of the best in the business. And then I had some great teachers that taught me about project management, somebody else that taught me about schedules. So, so I had a, I just knew that as I was starting to grow in my career, I needed to have a bitch of people that I could go to. It's not going to be one mentor or two. And sometimes you get conflicting advice, but th yeah. that's to be expected. But, yeah. you know, find multiple coaches and mentors. And, you know, along with that, number three is you got to get out of your comfort zone. It's yeah. okay to be scared. I will tell you, Many times when I was asked or put into a new position or something, was I scared? Hell yeah, I was scared. I mean, I might not tell everybody, but <laughs> yeah, I was scared. But you're not ever going to learn and grow unless you get out of your, your little comfortable position, your comfort zone. So come to grips with that and know that, you know, you're not going to advance and, until and unless you do that. And that's just a fact of life. And, and along those lines, you know, understand that your, your career path it's not linear. It's not like your college course catalog when you took this and then you took that and you took this and then I'd have a degree. Your, right. your, your career path needs to be very flexible, very adaptable. Right. And I'll use a word some people don't like, but it's opportunistic. You know, if yeah. you're going to succeed, you need to put yourself in a position where you're the best choice for that next role. So there's nothing wrong with being opportunistic. You know, you got to, you know, you got to be your own, you got to blow your own horn. You've got to make sure that you're positioned to be the best choice yeah. for the firm. But that's that's going to be you. In my career, I, you know, I left as the COO. Nobody ever just pulled me by my collar and said, go to this position, go to that. It, it was always somebody would retire, resign, or, or something would happen. And there was an opening and I always tried to position myself to be the best choice for that. You know, I was prepared. Right. I was aggressive. I was you know, going to keep up my work ethic. And management feels like that's a good choice then. Yes. So you're going to have to be flexible, adaptable, and then you're going to have to be opportunistic. When the time comes, my first big jump at Huey, I wasn't ready for it. You know, we had two of the leaders of our business left to start their own business. George Huey came to me and said, hey, I really want you to run this business. And I was what, 27 years old. And, I mean, but that's how you learn. And if he's, yeah. he didn't ask, are you ready? You want to do no. this? I need you to. I need you to do this. And I did it. And then all my career, I just keep thinking about somebody left and that created a void. Then yeah. I moved into that. So I kept moving up, but I was opportunistic. I was flexible. Uh, I was willing to make some changes and do things that were not necessarily comfortable, but but I did that. Uh, and then and my you last... know what? Not to interject, that reminds me though, like of sports again, you know, you have like, you know, uh, someone like Joe Montana, who then, you know, gets injured or can't perform. And then you have, you know, Steve Young pulling you, you that, that, that moment happens and you're on, you got to be ready. Got to be ready. Got to be ready. And then really last but not least, when you talk about this industry, just know there's many rewarding, successful, enjoyable career paths. You know, not everybody needs to come into the business thinking, I'm only going to be happy if I retire as a COO or CEO. Yeah. I mean, that's just not going to happen. What you've got to do is you've got to be honest with yourself and you've got to gravitate towards what you love. Yeah. So what I spent in the last 20 years when I'm helping and coaching people, you know, if somebody says, I want to be a leader in the firm and I'll help right. them coach them and say, we well, probably need these seven skill sets. One of those is business development, business generation. So if you're not comfortable going to a cocktail party and mixing and mingling and giving the elevator speech or standing in a group, standing in front of a group of people across the table, talking yeah. about your firm, if you're not comfortable doing that and you're really not willing to either take courses or coaching and, and really actively work on that skill set, yeah. you're probably not going to be a great leader because great leaders of the seven or eight skill sets 
they're probably not great at all of them, but they're probably really good at two or three and they're okay on the others and they have a great team around them. But right. I try to coach people to be honest with yourself. And there's a lot of people I know that are great technical engineers. They always say, I want to be a project manager. I want to be a project manager. And you coach them and tell them, here's the skill sets. Here's the attributes. You put them in a chance. You bring them along with some small projects. And then lo and behold, they tell you, Glenn, I just don't like managing people. I'm sorry. I don't like it when the client calls me and he's upset that we missed the missed the uh, deliverable on Friday. I don't know how to handle that. So, right. you know, take some baby steps. And if they realize that's probably not a great aspiration for me, but I want to be the best mechanical engineer this company has ever had. And I want right. to be a technical person. And I want to be the best at that. Hey, I applaud that because again, that person knows their role. They're that first baseman. They know what they're going to do, what's expected of them. So again, you know, I spend a lot of time trying to put people in the right position. And a lot of that's being honest with yourself. Yes. You know, if you're not good at certain things and you're not going to do Toastmasters or take a class in public speaking, et cetera, yep. if you're not going to work in it, it's just not going to happen. I mean, it just no. I've seen it happen over and over again, but I would never say, no, you can't do that. If you want to do that, you need to develop these other skills, Right. You know, working with people and et cetera, et cetera. So it's a fascinating business. And again, I'll tell yeah. you, after 46 years, I have no idea where the time's gone. I had such <laughs> a great time. I had such a great time because I had such great people around me, such yes. the coaches. And, you know, what I miss, that's what I miss. I still try to have lunch a couple of times a month with my old friends and talk to them yeah. about business because I miss the people. For me, it was like yeah. a big family. And I felt like my clients were the same way. They were my family. Right. So right. that's what I miss the most. And I, and I must have had a great time because I have no yes. idea where the time well, went. And I'm glad that within your time, which now being retired, you you get to spend it in different ways that, you know, you took the time to join us today. I mean, I just want to say thank you again so much. And we just at Lester, we continue to be inspired by the way you elevate our industry, the way in which you lead and how you're able to do it in your own unique way. You, you are truly a great example to the youth who are entering the field. And we hope to be able to spend more time with you in the future. You can come and grab lunch with me. Like I'm totally free. Like <laughs> sure. hey, we're well, in Atlanta. I'm not turning down free lunches these days. So there we Atlanta, go. Yeah. Okay. No, it's on Lester. Robert. It's on Lester. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, come see us. But again, I'm, I'm happy to help. It's nice to be able to impart some of the life lessons that I've learned. Some of the scar, we always talk about scar tissue. So yes. Happy to do that. So Excellent. feel free to call on me anytime. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Glenn. We really appreciate it. Thank you. For thank this. you, Rana. Best of luck to you guys. Yes. Yeah,